Now at three minutes, four seconds in, the vehicle now passing Mach 10, 10 times the speed of sound. Three minutes, 10 seconds in. About one minute remains now in main engine flight. Three minutes, 20 seconds in, altitude now passing 51 nautical miles, velocity 12,115 feet per second, downrange distance 118 nautical miles. About 20 seconds remain until we power down to the partial thrust mode in the main engine. Standing by for that partial thrust command. And powering down to partial thrust, standing by for main engine cutoff. And we see cutoff. Standing by for one, two stage step. And standing by. And separation. Neds is deploying. Standing by for igniter spark. And we have igniter spark standing by for ignition and ignition. Ignition on the second stage. Second stage chamber pressure is beginning to rise. Standing by for fairing step. Fairing step. Good chamber pressure in the second stage. Right where we want it to be. Four this minutes, is 50. Delta Mission Control at T plus four minutes, 56 seconds into tonight's flight. We've just heard Steve Agate report the successful execution of the events comprising the early portion of this evening's mission. The Delta IV second stage and GPS-2F satellite are traveling southeast over the Atlantic Ocean. The mission is now in the first of three planned RL-10 second stage engine burns, and all systems continue to operate nominally. This burn will last approximately eight minutes. I'm joined now by Lieutenant Mark McCulloch from the United States Air Force Global Positioning System Directorate. Lieutenant McCulloch, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thanks, Matt. It's an honor to be here for the launch of the fifth GPS-2F satellite. So you mentioned the 2F satellite. Uh, what right now is the status of the 2F program? The 2F program is nearing the completion of the production. And right now there's four, four of 12 satellites are on orbit, and they're meeting all mission requirements. And we have one satellite that is here at the Cape, processing for a launch that is planned for May of 2014 and the the remainder of the satellites are in storage at the Boeing facility and the plan is to launch them all out by the end of 2016. So that's the plan for the 2F satellites. Now with the legacy systems performing so well, many of them beyond their design life, how does that impact the 2F constellation? Well most of those satellites that are on orbit, the legacy satellites, are, have been up there well past their design life and they even though they are still operating nominally they, they don't have the new signals and the enhanced capabilities that the GPS-2F satellite offers and so it it benefits us by putting the the new satellite out there if, to have the the new L5 aviation signal and the aviation signal won't work unless there's four satellites with that signal up there so that's a little bit about the Constellation. So a little bit about you. Can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to join the Air Force? Of course, Matt. I joined the Air Force for two reasons. First, ever since I was a kid, I've always loved the military and, and knew I wanted to join and serve my country. I, I was When I was looking at which branch to join, I saw the Air Force and I saw all the cool technologies that they're working with, the cool jobs, you know, getting to be a fighter pilot or, or even right now getting to be a launch engineer is, is awesome. and and when I was in college, I decided to study engineering so that I could, I could, I could actually pursue those goals, and and luckily I'm here right now. So uh, you mentioned that you're a launch systems engineer. Can you li describe a little bit more your role within the GPS Directorate of the Air Force? Of course. So I work at the Global Positioning Systems Directorate, like you said, the GPS Directorate, and the GPS Directorate is in charge of acquisition of all, all things GPS, so that includes the ground control system, the user system, as well as the space system of what we just saw, the, the launch of the, the fifth satellite. And so they, uh, 
they so the the ground control system is actually what controls all the satellites on orbit and changes their attitude and determination to make sure that they're always pointed at Earth. And my job within GPS is to work launch integration between the space vehicle contractor, which is Boeing, and the launch vehicle contractor, which is United Launch Alliance, to make sure that both the space vehicle and launch vehicle are, are meeting all requirements and that they're compatible. Well, thank you. I appreciate that description, both of the GPS program and a little bit about yourself. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. We're going to be coming back and talking a little bit more with you a little bit later in the launch. But for right now, let's go ahead and check in on how mission progress is going and how things are looking tonight. Uh, we're approaching the end of the first of three planned RL-10 second stage engine burns. Our next event, second stage engine cutoff, or SECO-1, is scheduled to take place just a minute or two from now. Let's join Steve Agid for mission status. About uh, three minutes now remaining in this first burn. Nine minutes, 25 seconds in. Altitude now passing 168 nautical miles. Velocity 22,106 feet per second. Downrange distance 1,145 nautical miles. Burn continues to look good. Chamber pressure holding rock solid right where we want it to be. And good engine control. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining on the burn. Now coming up on the 10 minute mark. Mark, 10 minutes into the flight. Altitude now 170 nautical miles. Velocity 22,753 feet per second. Downrange distance 1,265 nautical miles. Two minutes remaining in the burn. Chamber pressure continuing to hold. Engine control is good. Coming up on uh, 10 minutes, 45 seconds in. A little less than a minute and a half remaining on the burn. Altitude now passing 172.5 nautical miles. Velocity 23,701 feet per second. Downrange distance 1,437 nautical miles. As of this point in the flight, the flight events have occurred uh, very close to their projected times. Coming up on 11 minutes 37, correction, 11 minutes 30 seconds in, mark, still looking good. Altitude now 172 nautical miles, velocity 24,532 feet per second, downrange distance 1,585 nautical miles. About a half a minute remaining on this first burn of the second stage. Engine control continues to look good. About 20 seconds remaining on the burn. Standing by for SECO. And we have SECO. Engine has shut down. The uh, next burn should occur about nine minutes from now. Passing uh, 12 minutes, 30 seconds into the flight. Altitude this is Delta Mission Control at T plus 12 minutes, 34 seconds into tonight's flight. Steve Agate just confirmed cutoff of the RL-10 engine. The mission has now entered a coast phase. This coast phase will last approximately nine minutes. The mission continues to follow a southeasterly trajectory over the Atlantic Ocean and is currently located southeast of the Antigua ground station. While we wait for the next mission event, let's take a look at video highlighting the important capabilities of the GPS Block 2F satellite. Mm -hmm. 
The Global Positioning System is a marvel of the modern age. It consists of more than 30 GPS satellites circling the globe over 12,000 miles above us. In tightly controlled orbits, these U.S. Air Force satellites continuously transmit their signals to Earth. An extraordinary technology, GPS enables anyone with a GPS receiver to determine their precise location and the exact time anywhere in the world, usually within a meter and within a billionth of a second. GPS is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's in our cars, it's in devices that you use to determine how far you've run or ridden your bicycle. With billions of users and countless devices, it is easy to take GPS for granted. But it is the essential platform for innovations, which enables us to do everyday things like buying gas at the pump and getting directions. And amazing things like tracking ice melts and saving lives in ways that were formerly impossible. The beauty of the GPS system is that it's available for everyone. Uh, the cost of entry for any user is simply the cost of their receiver. Boeing helped make GPS possible. It's been the U.S. Air Force's prime contractor on four major programs, replacing the initial group of satellites as their service lives were completed. Overall, Boeing has produced two-thirds of all GPS satellites, more than 40 in all. Satellites are normally built in a low volume, perhaps two or three at most and they're usually uh, sit in one spot and resources are brought to the satellite. Now, to ensure that GPS is available whenever it's needed, Boeing has changed how satellites are made. It's producing 12 new GPS satellites using a streamlined process based on its efficient and advanced airplane assembly line techniques. Our goal is to have the highest quality. These new satellites bring next generation performance to the GPS constellation we all use every day. As a result, they are delivering new levels of accuracy to what is already a remarkably accurate system, and they are being built in a much more efficient way, ensuring that this essential technology is available when we need it. This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 15 minutes, 22 seconds into tonight's mission. And the 2F5 mission uh, continues to operate nominally. Uh, second stage is currently in a coast. I'm joined again by Lieutenant Mark McCulloch from the United States Air Force. So, Lieutenant, we talked a little bit about the overall 2F program, but from an application perspective, people may be familiar with GPS in their cars or in their handheld devices. Can you tell us a little bit more about how widespread the application of GPS is? New ways to use GPS emerge daily, and I, I don't think I could tell you all of the applications because really, I mean, I don't think anybody knows what all the applications of GPS are. But uh, from a most basic standpoint, GPS is timing, and thus using that timing we get navigation. And from a, a civil side, a civil perspective, uh, some of the things people may not know is that GPS is used in farming, it's also used in a banking as far as tracking timestamps and any sort of banking transaction GPS is used and from a military perspective the the main the main thing the GPS helps out with is saving lives and I mean if, if you look at the search and rescue it takes the search at a search and rescue and an example that I have there was a there's a major who used to work in the GPS directorate and he uh, he went and did a speaking engagement up at a base on the west coast and after the engagement uh, enlisted special forces officer approached him and he uh, he said hey can I show you my GPS device and he's like yeah of course and so as he was showing it to him he explained to him how the GPS device not only saved his life but all the lives of the men around him because when they were, he was getting gunned down and he was hiding behind a wall and these vipers were, were steaming in hot and he had given them coordinates of where to hit but he wasn't sure is this device really going to work exactly like they said it would and sure enough it, it landed right on target and saved their lives and has saved countless others past that Wow, I mean, that, I think that highlights just how important it is for our military to be able to deliver these capabilities reliably. Uh, you also touched on some of the civilian applications and how people are used to this on a day-to-day -day basis. When did that really become available broadly for the consumer base? So, as you may know, we've been launching GPS satellites since the 80s and 90s, but we didn't actually reach full operational ca capability until 1995. And what full operational capability means is that we have 24 satellites on orbit, and that gives you continuous coverage of at least four satellites at any point on anywhere on the globe at any time. So I, I think that's important.